Hi everyone, welcome to the Philosophy of Freedom study course called Steps to Freedom. In this video I'm going to tell you how I came up with the steps in the Steps to Freedom. I will also explain the topic headings and numbering system you will find on the website. To make sure you are notified of each new study course video, subscribe and click on the notification bell. I've always had an interest in the thought structure of the Philosophy of Freedom. I wanted to make more sense out of the book by marking off the topics. These topics eventually became steps in the study course. What I knew is that each chapter begins with an introduction to the subject. This was followed by topics of discussion. For example, in the chapter Conscious Human Action, the subject is the question of freedom. This is followed by a series of different viewpoints of the subject. The topics discussed are freedom of indifferent choice, freedom of choice, free necessity of one's nature, and so on. The shift points where one topic ends and another begins is not always clear. This made my effort to outline the topics difficult. Without indicating his shifts, he used such words now in the humblest, now in the most exalted sense. I did find that each point of view is described, then its shortcoming is shown that must be overcome on the path to freedom. Steiner deals with each possible point of view, illustrating each one with an example from the literature, and then showing the fallacies or shortcomings that have to be overcome. Each viewpoint is a step that holds a challenge in the quest for freedom. Overcoming these challenges are the steps to freedom. Steiner explained his method of presenting a wide range of views. The philosophy of freedom presents the wide range of human standpoints, often masquerading under such strange philosophical names, in a way that leaves the reader free of attachment to any particular approach and able to let the various concepts speak for themselves, as though each were a photograph of one and the same object taken from many different angles. The way to truth is to view the subject from all sides. This is why today's demands for internet censorship of unpopular views is a threat to the pursuit of truth. For anyone who wants to penetrate into the truth of the world, it is important to realize that broad-mindedness is necessary because 12 worldviews are actually possible for the human mind. If one wants to come really to the truth, then one must try clearly to understand the significance of these 12 typical views. This last quote is from Human and Cosmic Thought. Steiner demonstrates that there are 12 main viewpoints of how we picture the world and seven ways to actively pursue knowledge. This diagram shows the ordered relationship between the world outlooks. When I saw this diagram, I thought, this must be the outline of the philosophy of freedom. To find out, I placed the outline over the text, and I was not surprised it was a match. Each chapter aligned with one of the seven ways of pursuing knowledge. With the outline, I was able to find the shift points from one view to the next and section off each chapter into 12 views. I gave each view a topic heading and a number. The first number is the chapter and the second number is the viewpoint. Each topic then became one of the steps to freedom. The steps are numbered consecutively from number 1 to number 192. Steiner did not use this thought structure in a superficial, intellectual way. By entering into a worldview, the thoughts that intuitively appear in the mind are an expression of that viewpoint. My method of presentation of the various world conceptions has its origin in my orientation toward thinking intuition. To affect thinking intuition, one must be capable of thinking idealistically with the idealist and materialistically with the materialist. For only thus will the faculty of thinking intuition be awakened. By directing our thinking to the physical world, the thoughts that intuitively appear in our mind will be materialistic. By directing our thinking to the world of ideals, it becomes idealistic, and so on. 
As we read the philosophy of freedom, we develop broad-mindedness by shifting from one viewpoint to the next. The viewpoints follow a specific sequence to bring about an effect in the reader. For in the case of a book like this, the important thing is so to organize the thoughts it contains that they take effect. With many other books, it doesn't make a great deal of difference if one shifts the sequence, putting this thing first and that later. But in the case of the philosophy of freedom, that is impossible. It will be just as unthinkable to put page 150 50 pages earlier as it would be to put a dog's hind legs where the front ones belong. To experience the intended effect of the thought structure, we rethink the thoughts in the text creatively and bring it alive by reproducing it out of ourselves as a musician expresses sheet music in their own way. The result is catharsis. Catharsis is an ancient term for purification by means of meditation and concentration exercises. If a reader takes this book as it was meant and relates to it in the way a virtuoso playing a composition on a piano relates to its composer, reproducing the whole piece out of himself, the book's organically evolved thought sequence will bring about a high degree of catharsis. Catharsis is the cleansing of the emotions and mind. The steps to freedom are based on the philosophy of freedom's evolving thought sequence. These steps are consciously taken to liberate us from excessive emotionalism and narrow-minded thinking. It is a cathartic process of renewal. Remember to subscribe and click on the notification bell.